morning. How's everybody doing today? Morning. Kevin and Grace Ann here. We are from Save Barn and Get Bay, and we are seining at High Bar Harbor today. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about where we are and the habitat as usual. Uh, we did pull a few seines already because the weather is kind of unsure. The noceums are killing us. You probably can't even see them. Um, and uh, we did get some cool stuff to show you. So we're going to show you some of those creatures. I apologize for the loud party guests. Um, I'm going to show you them too. So why don't, why don't we talk about birds first? Because as I start to talk more, they're probably going to keep moving. Um, so I'm going to turn the tripod around so that you can see our bird friends. Hi, four people. Um, so we are at our third virtual seining session. And, oh wait, I got it, the tripod has three, three things. So welcome everyone. This is our um, third virtual seining session with Save Barnegat Bay. And uh, the, sorry, the horizon is crooked because our tripod has lots of cool um, things. But I just want to show you uh, the birds that we have here first because they're super loud and you're not going to be able to miss them in the video. So um, in the distance you can see two different kinds of gulls and um, the one closest to us that has like a completely black head, that black hood indicates to me that it's a laughing gull. Um, and they're the ones that you hear that loud kind of cackling noise that they're making. French fry stealers. French fry stealers. <laughs> um, so laughing gulls are pretty common around here. You see them everywhere. They're on the bay side, they're on the um, uh, ocean side. And you can, if you can make it out, and I wish I could zoom in. Oh, I can. Okay. Um, if you zoom in, you can actually see them kind of shuffling their webbed feet to find food in the shoreline. And then the bigger, larger gull that's behind the laughing gull, um, kind of has its uh, backside to you right now, is a herring gull. So it goes laughing gull or the smallest ones. Um, that we see most commonly. And then we have the herring gull, which is kind of the medium sized one. They have those gray wings. And then we have, which I don't see it here, but oh, you see the little guy up front here? He's, he's shuffling his feet. See that? He's looking for food in the, in the wash. It's kind of cool to watch. Uh, we were here a few, um, I don't know, maybe a week or two ago, and there were horseshoe crabs spawning here. Um, so there's all kinds of different things right in the wash here that they could be looking for um, worms and small invertebrates and of course eggs and things so that's kind of cool to see um, let me try to straighten this out again and show you where we are so we are at High Bar Harbor which is on um, Long Beach Island and you're looking at Barnegat Bay again, of course. And I'm gonna just spin you around so that you can kind of get a view of where we are. So across the bay, which is kind of hard for you to see, is um, the mainland. And you might even be able to make out the Oyster Creek nuclear power plant in the distance as it comes into the screen on the right side. And then in the very far distance, you can see the channel markers for Oyster Creek Channel. Those are those large poles in the middle of the bay. And then you can't see it, but the uh, 40 North Oyster uh, Farm is out there. So uh, that's where um, 40 North uh, grows their oysters in cages for them to sell them to you at the market. And what else can I tell you about? Sorry, everything's a little crooked. Um, and then on the right side, you can see the shoreline. And this is that big sandbar that's right inside of Barnegat Inlet. So um, if you had x-ray vision, you would be able to see through the trees and the lighthouse is right on the other side of where we are right now. So this little spit of sand is at the, almost at the end, a northern end of LBI. And so I'm not going to keep going because it's just Phragmites and grass and everything else. So um, just to give you kind of a 180 of where we are. And then um, let me tell you a little bit about the bottom of where we went seining today because that's gonna some of it's some of it's good news some of it's bad news so I'm gonna set it back up over here so that oops so that you can 
Um, see where we are. All right. We're getting to be f real good film crew here. Um, if you want to stand over there so I can see that they can see us. Yes. Okay. Perfect. All right. So let me tell you a little bit about the bottom and where we are and, and the temperature. So air temp is pretty warm. Uh, water temp wasn't bad either. Uh, we were concerned about the rain and the fog again. We can't seem to get a good day for sanding these past two weeks. Uh, but that's okay. We're holding out. Um, but let's talk about the bottom because Kevin and I were here a few weeks ago and uh, we took GoPro footage of what we saw at the bottom, which was uh, patches of eelgrass beds. So it's really sandy behind us. There's not too much mud. And these eelgrass beds are, you know, kind of patchy. They're a little deeper, uh, maybe two and a half, three feet deep, um, maybe a few hundred feet off the shore. And remember, eelgrass is that long, and this is kind of clumps of it, but remember it's that long grass that stands up from the bottom of the bay. Um, the blades are kind of uh, rectangular. And uh, what we saw was um, eelgrass beds and it, there was some kind of filamentous algae on top of the eelgrass beds, which is not good. Um, and we can still, still see the grass though. Yeah, we could still see the grass. So we used the GoPro footage, which hopefully we'll share with you soon. And we did, we were able to see some of the grass. Um, this time we went seining and we dragged the net over the eelgrass beds and you pretty much can't see the eelgrass bed at all. All you can see is a giant patch of algae, um, which is really not good. So um, normally in Barnegat Bay, eelgrass is a habitat that allows for um, all kinds of different fish and, and invertebrates to hide in the grass. This algae grows in abundance and basically suffocates um, the eelgrass. So it's really, really heavy. Um, it's really awful and slimy uh, and you could just see it like like this awful hair all over the eelgrass and there was so much of it that it made the net really hard to pull and just uncomfortable and then in addition to that inside of all this gooey algae there was like animals caught in it so like baby silver sides and crabs and everything else so I didn't want to keep the algae out of the water because hypothetically you'd want to clean it off the, the eelgrass but it had all kinds of stuff living in it um, so I didn't want to keep it out of the water because all that stuff living in it you know we want that to survive so um, if you check out last week's video I go into the the differences between algae and plants and how algae is a um, is natural in the bay but too much of it is a result of too much pollution coming off the land. So um, I just wanted to talk about that. You can actually see there's a there's a silver side actually caught in it right now. Um, let's see if you can see it. See that little guy? He's kind of caught in there. Um, and there's even some eelgrass caught in there too. So it just it just gets caught on there, and there's just you can't. It's just gross. Why are we seeing all this algae again? Um, so, uh, rainwater, stormwater carries pollution off of the land and it um, brings it into the water. So eutrophication uh, is a fancy word for too much nutrient. And so that nutrient is nitrogen, primarily um, from fertilizer and dog waste. So again, the stormwater carries all that stuff into our waterways, our rivers, creeks, and streams, and it's carried into our bay. And then the algae picks up that nitrogen and uses it pretty quickly and it grows and it floats and then it just gets caught like a web on top of the eelgrass where the eelgrass would get its nitrogen from the soil and the nitrogen coming off the land is not in the soil, it's in the water. So, um, so basically so yeah. we're fertilizing the bay growing algae. Yes, we are growing algae. <laughs> uh, so hopefully um, we can stop doing that um, and get a better balance of algae and eelgrass in our bay. Um, all right, that stuff is so gross. It's really awful. All right, so what's up first? Let's see some critters. Okay. I want to point these out. We pointed these out last week. I always point them out because I love them. But we have two shrimp in here. Um, one, this one right here, actually they're both on top of each other. Look at that. We have a shore shrimp, which is showing himself up front, and a sand shrimp to the rear um, on the right-hand side. Uh, the shore shrimp has that rostrum, which is um, 
barbed, and that's an easy way to tell the difference. You can also see the massive eggs in the legs pretty well there. Um, they hold their eggs within the legs. Let me see if I can spin this around so you can get a better view of the shrimp. Here's this sand shrimp. You'll often find them st uh, straight on the bottom. Um, they're going to be in that sandy substrate, and they are going to be a flatter shrimp, um, and it has that sand color. Doesn't want to cooperate. There you go. Swimming for you. All right, let me uh, get our next contender here. here. I was showing off the shore shrimp with the eggs. Uh, this fish here with that snout right there is perfect. This is perfect show of the snout that actually will scoop those eggs right out of the legs of the shore shrimp. Um, this is our northern pipe fish, um, closely related to the seahorse. Uh, the males actually hold the babies in a brood sack, just like the seahorse does. And we find them often in the eelgrass beds within Barnegat Bay. Um, Do you want me to pull it out and show? Here, I'll pull a different one out. Yeah, it's really good camouflage. Um, that's the reason you can eat those eggs. It'll actually sit in the eelgrass. I've snorkeled the bay and I've seen them sitting in the eelgrass, swaying with the eelgrass, eating the eggs out right out of the shrimp. Like if you this? look here, yeah. Look at that camouflage with the eelgrass. Uh, it looks just like a blade of grass. So it'll sit there, wrap its tail around, and actually sway with the eelgrass and uh, just opportunistically feed on those, those eggs. They're often confused for eels because um, they're so long, um, but they're really beautiful. They have like um, this kind of hard, scaly, um, they're not slimy like a regular fish. Uh, they have, if, you, if I could describe them to you, they kind of feel like they're wearing an exoskeleton. Um, they're not, but they have like a skin over bones. So they're, they're kind of cool. They, they kind of have a neat texture to them. Uh, today we caught a ton of them. Uh, we, like I said, we walked through the eelgrass beds. We caught some that were so tiny you could barely see them. They looked like little tiny, tiny little, um, I don't even know, not, not even worms. They were so small. Uh, but we only kept the real big ones. So we have a, a few pipe fish. Sorry, I keep touching my face. I know it's not good um, <laughs> camera etiquette, but the no are pretty terrible today. Testing us. Uh, they're testing us. All right, so that's pipe fish uh, related to the seahorse. What do you have next? Okay, so yay. Mermaids love flounders. All right, so if you can see here, um, we have a summer flounder or what the locals lovingly call a fluke. Um, and I'm going to actually take him out of the jar. I, I like to keep the fish in the jar because I really want to make sure that they are comfortable. But I want to show you this one um, so that you can learn how to identify the difference between a fluke and a flounder because one is a winter flounder and one is a summer flounder and they are two different fish. So let me just pour this out really quick. Yeah. Oh, you have one? Mm -hmm. Oh. Do you want one? All right. Fish pass. Okay. So, I'm going to try really hard to show you this on camera. So, if I hold this fish with the mouth facing down towards my wrist, um, I can see that it makes an S shape with its mouth, kind of. See how there's kind of a, the top of an S? That indicates to me that it's a summer flounder, and it's kind of a cheaty way to, to identify it. Um, there are other ways to ID it with fins and coloration and everything else. So, I know this is a summer flounder, and I just want to show you in our book. Um, so the summer flounder, the, um, the scientific name is Paralichthys dentatus, and dentatus is kind of like having teeth. So summer flounder have teeth, and they go as far from Maine to Florida, so that's great. They have a really big range, and they have that spotted coloration that helps them blend in with the sand. All right, I want to get this guy back in the water so I don't upset him anymore. And they do have um, they do have that slime on them to, to protect them. So you always want to make sure your hands are wet um, when you are uh, handling um, the uh, fish. We have a huge no oh okay not yet. <laughs> we'll we'll do that one next. Um, what else do we have? Alrighty. All right, so, sorry, 
sorry about the delay there. We just had to grab some fishes. So t we have two little creatures, which hopefully you can see that they are different. Um, we have a long clawed hermit crab and a mud snail. And they look like they're the same animal because they're using the same shell. But the mud snail, ooh, you can see that. What's that? Is that long, that long thing there? You know what that's called? Uh, that's like what they feel around. They the feel around in the mud and they find the, um, the food that they need. So I have to look that up to remember what their, what that body part is called. But um, you can see kind of on the bottom. Oh, look, you can kind of see it like squishing out there. See his foot? See, the, that's a giant foot. So they are the cleanup crew of this area. They eat all the detritus and the mud and um, all the decaying matter. The long clawed hermit crab also eats decaying matter, but the long clawed crab doesn't make its own shell. It takes the shells of other creatures and it creates a little a protective covering for itself by using an old moon, um, mud snail shell. So if you look at a mud snail shell and it's moving really quickly, you know that it's a long claw crab. Look at that. That's a great view of him. Um, if you see mud snails at the bottom of Barnegat Bay and they're moving really slow and there's a bunch of them, uh, you know that they're still snails and the crabs haven't taken over their shells. Oh, cool. So Actually, can, is there one in there that's not in the dark? It's going to be kind of hard to see it. No. I'm going to try to spin this around. There is a... What is snail fur exactly? It's a hydroid. Hydroid. So it's related to sponge, right? Believe Maybe? That. Okay. So I think the, the snail fur, which if I can spin this around, is a hydroid. And it is another animal all on its own. And you can kind of see it's that fuzzy stuff on the, on the shell. Look at it closely. It almost looks like a feather duster. Um, looks like a common name for a worm in uh, the marine industry. Okay, so feather duster is the name of a worm, and these creatures are their own creatures. You can kind of—it's so hard to see, but they are—they are their own creature, and they live on the back of the hermit crab shell. So that's kind of really, really cool. Um, if you saw it up close, it looks kind of like hair, like a fuzzy hair, and it is a hydroid. All right, your turn. My arm hurts. This is another crab that we have in Barnegat Bay. I don't know if you can see it there. Uh, it's biting me, but we'll let it do its thing. It doesn't hurt as bad as the blue claw, although the, it would hurt a little child. Um, this is our lady crab. Um, it's a beautiful crab. It has speckling. It has a different shaped body, but it does have those swimmerettes on the back, um, which helps it move around. Um, it's just another crab you'll find. It ranges from Maine to uh, the Carolinas. And you will see it in the back bays, as well as closer to the rivers. It has that calico, that beautiful calico um, print on it. You can hardly see it because it's so dark. Yeah, it is dark today. But there's a couple different names for this. We call it lady crab, calico crab, um, she crab. There's a bunch of them. Um, but this is this is she. <laughs> uh, what else do we do? We have to talk about. Um, did we miss anything? All right, let me check and see if anyone has any questions. I'm always so quick to sign off um, before I actually get to talk with anyone. Um, whoops. I'm dealing with wet hands. Sorry about that. Let's see. Where are your questions? I'm going to take you off the tripod. No one has any questions? Hmm. Okay. Oh, there are questions. There they are. How do how big do the shrimp grow? Um, the shrimp we were looking at today, the shore shrimp and the uh, sand shrimp, they're gonna grow about one one and a half inches. They're not a very big shrimp. Um, we do have larger species of shrimp within Barnegat Bay, but they're they're limited in their numbers. Um, and do we eat these shrimp? We do not eat these shrimp. These shrimp are common bait shrimp. Um, the shore shrimp or com is commonly known as grass shrimp in the bait industry world. Um, so you'll often find those for sale 
Um, they're common baits for white perch and some people even use them for fluke. Um, so it's a good chum as well. Um, so you can buy those in the bait shops, the shore shrimp or grass shrimp. And then the sand shrimp, you don't often find those. So for sale, a lot of people, they'll come out with a sand net, gather their own, they'll use those for bait as well. Uh, will the hermit crab take over a living snail's shell? Hermit crab won't take over a living snail shell because the snail's inside. Um, I have seen them cleaning out like a dead snail shell to make it their home, but uh, that would be how that goes. You know? <laughs> They're um, not taking the over. Snail leaves first, and then uh, the hermit crab uh, will move on in. Uh, Mac McDougall would like to know if we've had, if we've seen any sea robins. We haven't. But is this the habitat for them? You will see sea robins in the bay. Uh, most of the time you'll see them all, uh, in the ocean as well. Um, but I, with, usually you'll see sea robins um, later on in the season we'll have young ones. Um, so we'll see those in the same net sometimes depending on location. Yeah, it is still kind of early yet mm -hmm. um, to be getting everything. And if you watched last week's video you saw that um, we got a lot of similar things even though uh, we're in a different location. So we are just south of, not just south, but we are south of last week's location. Last week we're on the back side of Island Beach State Park. Uh, and then this week we're on the back side of High Bar Harbor. So we're facing the same direction. Uh, we're just south of the inlet this time. And if we do come back to this location later in the season, you'll see different species. We'll get a lot of uh, species that come up on uh, eddies off the Gulf Stream. So you'll see sometimes some tropicals, especially in this location. I've caught them in the past. Can you talk a second about the Gulf Stream and what that even means? The Gulf Stream is like an underwater river that runs, um, I guess, perpendicular to the coast from the south to the north, and it carries uh, water. And it's basically how our ocean moves around. Um, but some years it's closer, some years it's further offshore. Um, on years that it's closer, and if we have the right wind and we have the right eddy coming off that Gulf Stream, um, we'll get some weird species from the south. It's almost like a conveyor belt. Uh, if they get in that current, they'll be brought up north. And then with those eddies, they'll be close enough to shore where they'll come in on, on high tides and such. And the Gulf Stream moved closer to the to the to us this year. Or? I have not checked recently, but oh, um, I thought you were saying that one time. It's okay. Yeah. Sorry, I put Kevin no on the spot sometimes. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> we're just having fun out here, um, having a good conversation about um, the different creatures. Uh, so, does anyone have any other questions for us? In the meantime, I'll give you a good view of our um, our birds again. For those of you who jumped on later, we have the laughing gulls here in the summertime. And I didn't mention this, uh, but the ring-billed gull comes in in the wintertime and tends to be a similar size and shape to the laughing gulls. So if you see in the wintertime, they, they take their place, if you will. Um, lots of other birds come and go, um, and it's kind of cool. I'm actually going to see if I can walk up to the laughing gull because he's shuffled. Oh, no. He was shuffling his feet in the sand, which is super cool to watch. And if you watch shorebirds, a lot of them do that, um, looking for food in the in the wash there. Ooh, there he goes. There's a little shuffle. Uh, do you find pea crabs other than inside oysters? What are pea crabs? That's a small, very, very small crab that has a symbiotic relationship with an oyster. Okay, so pea crabs have a symbiotic relationship with the oyster, which means they sometimes live, what, in the edge of the shell? Within the mantle, I believe, of the shell, um, within the oyster itself and within the reef. So have you found them at, other than inside an oyster? That's what Mac is asking. Personally, I have not. I have never personally seen one myself. So. Okay, so probably have to live inside of the oyster. Um, I can even, while, I'm off, while you're off the tripod, let's see. We have a few more minutes here. I can actually bring you into the bay. Huh? It's hard to see, but there's a bunch of terrapins. You see their heads. Oh my around. gosh, there's terrapins. We walked up today and there were terrapins popping their heads up all over the place. Oh, there's one in the distance. I don't know if you could see it in the camera. They pop their little heads up. Um, Diamondback Terrapins, it is Terrapin Appreciation Week. We should talk about that. Uh, Terrapin Appreciation Week is this week. Uh, we have an event today at noon, so go check out Project Terrapin's website. Project Terrapin is having a week full of events to uh, recognize the diamondback terrapin, which is our uh, Barnegat Bay species of turtle. Terrapins are the only species of turtles that live in brackish water where salt and fresh water mix. Ooh, the herring gull got some breakfast. Off he goes. Um, so uh, there's terrapins all in the water here that if you watch closely, and I don't shake too much, I'm going to walk because the no -see are killing me. Um, and I can show you that it's really clear today. So you can see all the mud snails underneath the water which is kind of cool um there's a razor clam shell right there Bloop. um and i can actually show you because it's so clear today i can actually show you the algae that is coating the eelgrass beds 
and you'll actually get to see what I mean. I can't put my phone under the water, but um, I'll, I'll show you what I mean. I wish you were here. I wish you were here so that I can show you all these things in person. Oop, there's a scallop. I don't know if it's alive. We do have bay scallops in Barnegat Bay, very few of them. Um, they are a shellfish that can move. Uh, they use jet propulsion, so you can kind of see, uh, sort of in the very center of the screen. I kicked up a little bit of mud, so it's kind of hard. There was a shell. Here, let's see if I can grab it. Ugh! My arm's all wet now. There is a scallop shell, so that's kind of good to see. There's scallops around here. Hi, Sarah. I wish you were here. You would be doing a good job of talking about all this stuff, too. Um, all right, let me show you the eelgrass beds out here. Um, these are all mud snails that you can see. I don't know if you can make them out in the camera, but they look like little black dots. They're all the mud snails. Whoop. All right, so I'm going to stand really still for a second, and I'm going to try to show you this without going underwater. I'm going to have to wait for my ripples to pass. Um, so if you look really closely and my camera focuses, you can see over here, this is all sand. And right here is the edge of where the eelgrass bed is. And eelgrass does not, is not that color. <laughs> eelgrass is actually um, all different colors of green where this kind of algae is like this yellow mustardy brown awful gunk stuff and that is what's covering the eelgrass bed so i'm gonna try to walk really really gently around it so you can see see there it is there you can kind of see there's the edge there's the edge of the grass and where the eelgrass bed starts and then that all that filament is what's laying all over the eelgrass you can't even see it um, i'm gonna stick my hand in there and lift it up so you can see this stuff it's just this awful filament and we're feeding it um, on the land when we we leave nitrogen all over the land the rain carries it into the water and it just collects on top of the grass blades and suffocates the grass so it can't photosynthesize so other than the fact that the noceums were murdering us. It is a beautiful day here. Um, they're still, they follow me all the way out here. Uh, so if anyone, no one has any other questions for us, I will see them, leave them in the comments below. I'll see them when I jump off. Otherwise, tune in with us next Thursday at 10 a.m. Uh, you never know where we will be. We'll have to figure out where our next seining location is and um, stay in touch with us. My email is education at savebarnegatbay.org. Again, my name is Grace Ann, and uh, thanks, for, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for being there with us. All right, we'll see you next time.